Um, welcome to my live discussion and today I would like to discuss my latest essay which is called Revolutionary Monsters, the Suicide of Identity Politics. And um, first of all I wanted to discuss uh, the general frame within which I try to think about uh, revolution and the Hi. And the general frame is uh, biological. The general frame here is supposed to be evolutionary. And the reason of this discussion is basically to check my ideas with you and to see if I'm already completely insane doing this or uh, if there is still, thank you, if there is still hope. So the framework of my uh, idea about ideas about revolution is evolutionary and I'm trying to think biologically concept and framework of evolution as such that doesn't contradict uh, ideas, left ideas of, rev of revolution. So, but uh, to do this, I think that uh, one's supposed to understand in a correct way the idea of evolution because common understanding of evolution is wrong. Uh, usually we perceive it in a wrong way and same with the idea of revolution, this left idea of revolution. I think uh, if, we, if we understand it in the right way, it coincides perfectly, almost, with the uh, idea of evolution. So what's wrong with this? Um, how, how do we fix the common idea of evolution? First of all, a common idea of evolution presupposes that it's gradual betterness, like it's getting better all the time. Uh, species get more adapt to the environment, uh, they're getting more... Um, uh, optimized so it's and uh, the other idea is that it's gradual it's supposed to be some slow gradual changes and on the other hand the idea of revolution the way we uh, what is wrong about it the left idea of uh, revolution is that it it presupposes the radical change like everything uh, it was a wrong order and in some this romantic perspective there's supposed to happen some event supposed to happen and there will be installed some perfect order and especially the idea that it will bring happiness total happiness and harmony mm, so i think we should make it like less romantic maybe romantic but in a bit different way and why do i want to combine evolution with revolution it's because uh, i am materialist and I think materialistic way to think about things is, um, is evolutionary way. So evolution is the only materialistic way of explaining things because within this perspective, it explains how things uh, appear from not outside, from uh, not uh, as a result of some purpose or uh, some goal directed process. So not somewhere from outside, but from inside. So from the very from bottom from materiality of things without any higher dimension and not only in the level of biology of development of species but also in the level of uh, culture and yeah in common understanding this gradual betterness and evolution since uh, things because we presuppose that evolution is goal directed and this is still a residual of the teleological thinking like there is a goal everything gets improved and in this perspective in this common vision of evolution the human human being is a center is the uh, the goal of evolution was a mm, creation of human being and but real evolution is uh, not goal directed and it's a mindless process materialistic mindless process and Dennett Daniel Dennett writes about it in his amazing book uh, da Darwin's uh, dangerous idea but he tries to combine it with the idea of cultural evolution but I have I think I have a uh, better perspective some develop some <laughs> insights on basis of his thinking and um, so we still normally even evolutionary biologists they don't get the this materiality of evolution they see, still presuppose they still project this old theological thinking presupposing some goal directedness like there is some higher dimension God who directs it in the right way and they still think it as human as with a human at the center 
and they still presuppose that it's some some kind of betterness, some kind of optimization. All of this old way of thinking, they still it's still inscribed in the evolutionary thinking. And to clear evolutionary thinking from this perspective, this is what I'm trying to do today to see. And later we'll see revolution. I'll try to show revolution as a part of um, of evolutionary cultural process. But um, uh, yes, and the, why normally evolution uh, is, is thought as something different with a revolution, because evolution is presupposed usually to be gradual, and revolution is thought as a radical change. But I will show this, those are not contradictory things. So, uh, Dennett nicely ex explains that evolution doesn't presuppose any goal directedness. It's not teleological. And Marx was uh, writing that it's um, destroyed the theory of Darwin theory of evolution. Totally destroyed this teleological perspective, the teleological thinking um, of an um, of unfoldment of some plan of some objective um, movement toward the um, achievement of some objective. Mm, and uh, what we also need to understand that uh, what we perceive as a goal of evolution or as an optimization, we always input these ideas uh, re retroactively, re retroactively. So first something, it, uh, first something appeared, and only then, only afterwards, we, pre we presume that this was developed, uh, something was uh, attained, uh, and it was goal directed, but it it wasn't. And the the very stuff of evolution, the very um, force of evolution, its greatest material are mutations. And mutations it's a is a great uh, way to explain how evolution um, works. Mutations are deviation from existing combination of genes. So there are some mistake in the in the reproduction of genes, and this is how the um, differences appear. So mutated genes, they are present in all species, are material for evolutionary selection, and even the small number of mutated genes, it provide a potential for genetic uh, variability. And mutation, it's uh, something that it's hard to inscribe in a goal directedness and into this positivity that we tend to, uh, that we tend to think Whatever we think about, we tend to think about it as positive process. That what I'm trying to show that uh, you can think about everything, <laughs> just um, destructiveness is enough. The level of mistake, the level of, destruct of, of destructive, it's normally enough to explain things without presupposing this um, mm, some level of beyond or going somewhere to the level of positivity. This level is not, it's still the, it's echo of this teleological thinking. And it's just the mm, pattern of our thinking. And if you get rid of it, everything will be still possible to explain. So evolution, if we presuppose that mutation are the driving force of evolution, mutation are destructive. So it's a mistake. It's a mistake of replication of genes. And some of these mistakes, some of those mutations, they, uh, they might later be uh, replicated and the species going to be going to change in this way. So um, basically mutations are destructive because they are they're harmful mo for most part and they are always not always um, in many cases they're lethal so they, they can cause death and the reason for that so they are destructive and the reason for this because organism uh, adapted through the process of evolvement to a certain um, to certain uh, where they live the circumstances of their living and uh, uh, mutation the um, the mistake in reproduction of genes it changes all some of those processes that I needed for a species to to interact with their surrounding, and and species it might be it might it disturbs this order and it might be lethal for species and harm, harmful for species. But the interesting thing that um, it's not uh, there is no goal in mutation to uh, adapt the species to certain environment. There is no goal at all, and just what. Uh, 
if mutations start to be defining for start to be defining for certain species, we can only claim it retroactively. So, mm, yeah, backwards. If some species survived uh, because of some mutations, we only claim that it was adaptation because they survived. And, and it only defined uh, afterwards. It's only defined in a uh, in the interaction of a species with a, with um, with their surrounding, with their sphere of their existence. For example, if um, if there is a mutation that causes albinism, it's good for a species uh, who um, whose surrounding is who uh, exist in Arctic conditions, but. Um, or the condition, the surround condition, condition of surrounding changed, so they will survive. But it's bad for and lethal for um, species who depend on uh, on the feature that was changed. So it's only retroactively that we um, we can define either uh, the change, the mutation, the destructive process was helpful or it wasn't helpful. And um, the best thinker here is uh, Stephen Jay Gould. Uh, evolutionary biologist who um, was against the idea of goal directedness of evolution and against the idea of um, the idea that evolution is uh, implies gradual changes and he questioned goal directedness and he um, invented amazing um, amazing term uh, well, first of all, we need to we need to state that for him, for uh, for Gould, uh, evolution is like a game, and the game of chance, not the game where uh, whoever will win will um, will depend on skills of, of those of players. Uh, it it depends first of all of, on chance, and the best um, the best example for, for this game is even not just game of chance, but the mm, this royal croquet from Alice in Wonderland where you don't exactly know the rules and you don't exactly understand why someone is a winner so it just happened and talking about this so evolution doesn't have a goal it works like this mm, talking about this he claims about uh, he um, instead of the term adaptation he presupposes a term mm, he invents a term exaptation and exaptation it's it's um, mm, implies this absence of goal directedness he claims that all the new features in species they appear because of the quirky functional shift so this weirdness uh, appeared and later either um, was too destructive for species to survive or too destructive um, or just disappeared or started to be a defining feature of a certain species. And for example, our ability to write and read is this uh, example of acceptation. It wasn't not it was not goal directed um, process that um, helped us to develop these abilities. It was just um, the deviation of something else. And the famous example of it is uh, feathers, birds' feathers that evolved initially for the uh, thermal regulation and only later where uh, this exit exapted uh, to the to help birds fly so all those features they don't they don't they're not mm, they were not they were never presupposed as a goal as a certain object uh, they were never presupposed as the object of some uh, of some process it was always this uh, destructive process of uh, querying or mutation or deviation all the destructive things or some distortion of initial um, initial functioning so another great idea that uh, Stephen Jay Gould uh, was supporting is idea that initially belongs to uh, Richard Goldsmith this is idea of uh, hopeful monsters and this is the connection with uh, with uh, the idea of monstrous of monstrosity and revolution that Negri and Hart uh, develop. So those hopeful monsters in biology, the idea that belongs to uh, Goldsmith and later was supported by Stephen Jay Gould, presupposed this, that some radical change in some changes, for example, that uh, presupposes that new species appear. It's not gradual. There's supposed to be some radical 
macro mutations. Yeah, we can explain evolution within the species, changes within the species by uh, graduality. They can be um, gradual, so it's ma ma micro mutation. Um, but the, um, for species to change into different kind of species, they're supposed to be macro mutation. And this macro mutation, the radical mutation, it's what um, Goldmiss and um, Gould call hopeful monsters. So I, although it's almost 100% that is lethal, um, it should appear those hopeful monsters supposed to be possible. Uh, in order for such radical changes that we can see in, in evolution. And the very word, uh, monsters, uh, it's the medical term for the... So the, the fetus, the child uh, the offspring of certain species, the, the certain species gives the offspring, uh, give birth to uh, something that radically deviates from itself, some radical uh, um, monsters. And those monsters, the medical term for such fetuses, so severely uh, deformed fetuses, is terata. And terata is from, um, from uh, ancient Greek terrace, which uh, translates, of course, first of all, as monster. But the other meaning are just amazing. It's a wonder, so it's some magical thing. And the other interpretation is a formation and also charm. Will come from this word and it's it's amazing word because in all of those interpretation you have everything you need for the mm, for explanation what i'm trying to explain this deviation this destructivity is a magic but the magic within the materiality it's not from somewhere from out doesn't come from somewhere outside it's within because it has the life forming not life forming just forming powers the destructiveness that is and it's charming of course so the idea that this formation are material, uh, uh, they come from uh, destructive powers and they are within the materiality itself. It's everything is uh, together in this, in this term, the ter terras monsters. And uh, there were uh, some attempts to connect evolutionary thinking with um, thinking about culture. For example, we know about Dawkins, his idea of memes, the units of information, any unit of information we can call a meme. And uh, for example, the patterns of behavior, some ideas and anything in a sphere of information. And Dawkins was trying to uh, see the development of culture through the through lens of evolution. So memes are like genes, they mutate, just the mutation is more radical. It's much more radical and we have also the options of more radical um, hybridization. So something that is unconnectable with something, it's got connected and something new, not really new, just radically weird <laughs> appears. And uh, I like Dawkins. I know many people are criticizing him, but uh, well, I like the idea, at least uh, an attempt to do it. But um, now tendency is to, to claim that memes are um, unnecessary term because we can, we also have in semantics, we also have a term, already have a term sign. And we can call it, since it's about uh, information, we can call it uh, just a sign. But um, I think better idea is to call this something that got reproduced, some material uh, principle of reproduction and culture is material, culture. So because it's material, it's, um, it's supposed to be developed on this, uh, supposed to be developed uh, w within the laws of evolution, of laws of materiality. Um, unless we claim that human being is a creator and uh, project the idea of the theology of some another dimension of uh, metaphysical dimension if you don't we're supposed to figure out the way to explain it through the perspective of evolution and Dawkins was one of the attempts but i think the great idea it's to uh, not to call the things memes something that reproduces and deviates and mutates and uh, gets monstrous I think better idea is to call it just habit because we can explain everything through the concept of habit. Whatever we do, our patterns of thinking, um, even some biological thing, the change of season, 
and the whatever everything gets repeat everything is repetition and this repetition we can claim we can claim that it's a habit it's a habit of nature a habit of language is a habit because we all we always repeat certain words if uh, if it's not repeated it's not a word doesn't make sense even uh, certain inter interactions with people we always repeat uh, dialogues we are repeating everyday routine I repeat even traditions of uh, country <clears throat> of countries can be claimed uh, to be a uh, habits and uh, I have a paper where I explain that habits it, it's not uh, apart from the fact that it's repetition it's always it's um, also the deviation it's also the space of modification there is no uh, go, we can explain everything without going outside of a concept of habit because habit uh, when it tries to repeat, it always deviates. There are some mutations in this, um, in the repetition. And uh, of course, we can talk about Deleuze's idea of repetition, difference and uh, repetition. And everything I just said, the idea that um, patterns and everything repeats just got deviated and just those, because of those mutations, those uh, or perversions, the other word, um, all those exaptations, um, we can claim here, we can uh, talk about uh, Deleuze's idea of difference and repetition uh, just uh, to see as a center, as a starting point, the difference itself. Because for Deleuze, and Alenka beautifully, Alenka Zupancic uh, explains it really well in her book on comedy, uh, this Deleuzean perspective where he, he claims he admits that everything what exists is is repetition, but the perspective, the point where he starts with, is a deviation, is a introducing of difference. So I, even if everything repeats, it always fails to repeat. And this failure of repetition, this is how difference appears yeah, within as a residual, as a byproduct of um, of repetition. But still, it can be seen as a central process, and this is how the um, the variety of differences can be explained. And uh, the way I and of course the idea of uh, the one that was presented in an essay of Negri and Hart um, idea about uh, monsters, revolutionary monsters, it fits perfectly here with the loss as well. Uh, because monsters for them are some excessive uh, within the modernity. It's some force that um, goes beyond the modernity, but for, for some uh, already existing patterns of behavior. So those habits that we repeat, it, this is something different. This is, and monsters are at the same time the product, they are repetition, but they are, uh, but they are um, perverse repetition, mutated repetition. So it's an ugly child of a, of a mother that it's the mother give birth to her but she doesn't recognize herself in the in the monster that appear so it's at the same time a product of certain um, of certain rationality of modern uh, state of things but at the same time it's deviation and uh, here we can see that it repeats this evolutionary principle of of existence and but for negri and hard what i don't like is that they still do this um, uh, they still do this our when uh, when there is negation and then it's overcoming of negation and it, negation start to be positive some generative I think that it's the just negation is enough we shouldn't go on some some other some other layer where it gets positive it doesn't have to be positive when it's positive it's installed uh, order so it's not a monster anymore if it's negative it's not a monster if it doesn't contradict if it fully coincides and positive is some uh, establishment of some order then it's uh, it's not a monster anymore and revolution is monstrous it's something about monsters and mm, in this way we can claim that uh, it, the idea of revolution that Negri and Hart, uh, and it is Deleuzean. It's quite Deleuzean because it's not that something that happens, uh, some order that it's installed from outside. It's something that uh, some processes that happen within the the present order, some modification, monstrosity that um, 
that shows the very changeability of the present order. And um, this is why I like it. And it's, uh, of course, Deleuzean, because for Deleuze, there is no one final revolution that is the somewhere in the outside exists, the idea of which exists outside of certain order and can be installed um, or figure out and presented in, in books, in philosophical books or something like that, and then installed. For him, uh, evolution is always becoming revolutionary. So being these um, mutants, um, those monsters. And uh, for Negri and Hart, the example, but I think it's not radical enough example of, um, of monsters are uh, witches because they are, they don't, um, there's something dangerous for present order because they don't obey the existing, the existing uh, religion dogs, um, norms of that time. So they were presenting because the society, the present order it always want to, uh, um, to preserve itself. And it sees any um, any uh, different dif differentiation, any deviation within itself as, as dangerous. So it's, uh, I think, normal if it's seen if those something that is different is seen as uh, as dangerous. But it doesn't mean it, it doesn't have to exist because this dangerous thing within this something that is different from the present order and which is the product of this present order. If there are no these differences, the process of evolution and evolution is a materialistic uh, way of explaining life it never ends it's just the uh, life the way it unfolds so if it stops if this uh, appearance of difference is stopped in uh, repetition uh, there will be nothing evolution will stop and life will stop so um, the example that Negri and Hart principle the other one except for witches is a woman who doesn't coincide with the image of woman mm -hmm. It's not, for example, uh, caring or so it, it, it has appearance of a woman, but this appearance doesn't coincide. So it's not something that within this um, order of things, we presuppose that this appearance is supposed to do. And for them, the feminism um, is supposed to be, they, they claim that feminism is um, on the, and identity, ident identity politics in general. It's something that has to be suicidal because identity politics uh, claim the goal of this is establishment of some uh, of some identity of some of something that is already present some repetition and establishment and which presupposes domination and the ideal they oppose uh, revolution for them have the goal of liberation while while and feminism identity politics they have a goal of um, of emancipation and emancipation means the the final mm, result of this politics if it's uh, it's not suicidal is establishment of certain of certain identity and establishment of certain identity means that what is established what is solidified the identity is not monstrous anymore and it contradicts the idea of this becoming revolutionary of the the very flow of life uh, if you can claim it. So the perfect way, uh, something that the identity politics that, is, that, that uh, pursue this goal of uh, mutation, of um, monstrosity, it's a queer politics, but um, Negri and Hart, they warn us that today we perceive idea of queer as a part of LGBT movement and some, as, as some of, uh, some, some kind of, uh, installed uh, identity but uh, there is a huge potential in the idea of queer as a constant query as ident not identity but some formation of identity that never solidified as this potential of monstrosity that never gets um, positive never gets uh, established and as a result uh, never starts to participate within the the, uh, the already existing hierarchical uh, hierarchical roles. So in, in this way, they use idea of LGBT politics and they presuppose that this is something that, uh, this is either it's identity politics that always commits suicide because there is no uh, queer doesn't have identity. It's always the, mm, mm, 
rejection of any identity. It's not interested in solidifying identity. So maybe even if it's not a type of identity politics, but something can be something uh, self-sufficient, some self-sufficient process. And the, what I personally um, question in feminism, the idea of um, establishment and affirmation of identity of woman, uh, the, the romantic view here is that uh, you can take the relationship of man and woman, the sexual, which we still define ourselves basing on somehow within the frame of sexuality, which is initially patriarchal. The, I was writing about this in two of my uh, Rutledge mm, papers, chapters. The very scope of sexuality within the sphere of sexuality within which we define ourselves is hierarchical and is patriarchal. So if we still proclaim ourselves, some, someone <laughs> still proclaim themselves a woman, they necessarily exist within this patriar patriarchal relationship, even if they, um, even if they try to, um, to change this uh, hierarchical, uh, hierarchical structure, they still only somehow affirms this hierarch hierarchical structure. And I like Monique Wittig idea, she was a radical feminist, the idea that the very notion of woman presupposes that it's something secondary in relation to man, something um, that, d that is different from the norm. And in this way, it's on the one side, it's great because it's monstrous, so it's maybe even better than, than what is presupposed to be a norm, but it's still this old, Old frame of uh, old frame of perception, and what Monique Wittig uh, suggests to do is to she claims that she's lesbian, but uh, lesbian are not a woman because lesbian they don't exist with this within the heterosexual norm. But the problem with the term lesbian uh, is same as problem with a woman. It just uh, it's woman and woman, so we, it's we still keep the basic notion of woman from which concept of lesbian derives. And um, so what I was trying to claim that uh, there are many ways to define a human being. And if you, if you jump into this monstrosity and queerness, we don't have to preserve this um, existing differentiation of human being because when we try to preserve it, we don't see the other alternatives. And the alternatives are never goal oriented. It's always um, outside of any goal, outside of any object, uh, mm, any goal-directed processes. And uh, what I like the most about Hart and Negri is that they, the last quote, the last passage of the essay is where they claim that revolution, it's not a, this revolutionary process, it's not, it not, doesn't presuppose any happiness or harmony. Because happiness and harmony, it's first of all the, mm, the preservation of order, where we feel comfortable where we feel, uh, we know that uh, someone is woman, someone is man, it feels good. We have this idea that something, something bad that exists in those relationships can be taken out of those relationships and they're gonna be perfect. But we don't, don't understand that something, something that is good in those relationships is the other side of it, it's something bad. <laughs> so it's not, we can't take away one part out of this hierarchy, if we preserve, uh, relationship of woman and man as basic as defined in human beings they're going to be always going to be this secondary terrible part with the great other part so the only way out it's not way out it's just the way of this is this querying of already uh, existing di existing differentiations and uh, we don't and uh, there are going to be differentiations the differences just they're going to be different and for us and this is what Gigi claims and Elena Kazupancic claims that um, se sexual difference is basic, it's supposed to be preserved. But if we think about it in an evolutionary frame, the very sexual differentiation already appeared as, as a result of mutation. This, uh, so it, it, in some point in the history, it didn't exist. It's not such a, um, it's not kind of a part of metaphysical, um, metaphysical part of human being it can be changed so this is um, the essentiality of uh, of sexuality of sexual differentiation uh, those go together by the, by the way um, 
this is something get, that can be revised. And for Monique Wittig, the great, her great idea is that woman is kind of a notion of woman is the same as a notion of, of a slave. So what we want to do now within the feminism, it's we want to preserve the definition of woman and just emancipate her claiming that she's still a woman. So it's like a, emancipating a slave, but it's still kind of a slave. So it, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, yeah, so this is the, the revolution, the, some ideas about how I can, we can connect the ideas of evolution and revolution. If there are any questions, I can answer them. I can't check the previous um, lives, previous posts. So if you have any questions, you can ask them here in the current live video. Or the other option is that you can write the question later and I will answer them next next couple of days. And then that's, uh, that's it for today then. Thank you so much. Please ask me questions later. Bye-bye.